Good morning and welcome to another Unpublic with Citizen Stewart. Today is Freedom Friday and you are still not free, but hopefully after an hour with us, you will be freer than you were than when we started. Uh, as always on Freedom Friday, Sharif el Meki is the guardian of the show. He's the one that keeps me honest and uh, keeps my bad takes to a minimum. I hope that's what he does. Today we have a very special guest. We are always talking Whatever the subject matter is on our Freedom Friday, we are always talking about um, the subtext of what we're talking about is black pedagogy, rescuing black uh, pedagogy from history and making it uh, the practice of the day, bringing it into today. Our guest today is Dr. Jarvis Givens, an, an assistant professor at uh, Harvard Graduate School of Education and the Suzanne Young Murray Assistant Professor at the Radcliffe Institute, having earned his PhD in African American, or I'm sorry, African Diaspora Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, wow, 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 you got into Berkeley. Damn, uh, <laughs> you the one. Okay, all right, <laughs> you the one. He, he over there uh, with Dr. Bristol. Yeah, I mean. yeah. wow. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm often surprised by the Ivies or whatnot, but Berkeley's not a, a, a big door to get through. That's a narrow door. Yeah. Um, Dr. Jarvis also has a book right now, and that's the, the topic of today's show. The book that uh, Dr. Jav Jarvis has, or I'm sorry, Dr. Gibbons has, that you can find on Amazon is called Fugitive Pedagogy, The Art of black teaching. This is the book he's holding it up right there. Um, I highly recommend that we all go read this book. Let's not be individualists. Let's be collectivists. Let's go get the book together, have the knowledge at the same time and come back and talk about it again. But Dr. Givens, welcome, brother. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. So thanks for reaching out um, to, you know, to bring me to your platform and to talk about this important history that's really uh, a legacy that that all of us are the inheritors of. So um, I to talk about it. Yeah. So why don't we just start at the beginning? Uh, uh, that well, first, El Mecki, how you doing, brother? Good, doing well, man. Good. Yeah, Good jump in, and I'm grateful for uh, you know for this platform to be able to share. And I hope Mama Toya and the rest of the Eight Black Hands uh, crew use this as a as a uh, book club. Uh, you know, next book up uh, for the Patreon. All right. So uh, Mama Toya, who's always listening and, and watching, runs our Eight Black Hands book club. Uh, yes. But now that you said that, Sharif, you know what she's going to say is we need more <laughs> black males in that book club. In the book. Yeah, she's like, yeah. Man, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. So if we have any black males listening and watching, you should join this this book club. And, and hopefully, uh, Dr. Oh. Givens, uh, if they choose the book for the club, you would come and... Uh, come in and talk to them about it. I would love that, absolutely. So why don't we jump in and uh, why don't we just start at why this book, why did you start with this? What was attractive about the subject of this book that that drew you in and made you want to dedicate your life to writing this? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, that question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this, this writing this book went in ways, right? So this is an extension of some of the research that I began doing when I was doctoral student at UC Berkeley. Um, I came I didn't go to graduate school to study the history of black education at all. Um, I was in the second semester of my first year and I came across a footnoted reference to, you know, these textbooks that were written by Carter G. Woodson. And I had I did, the idea of black teachers writing textbooks in the early 20th century was not something that I had ever really imagined. So I was intrigued by that. And I started to kind of dig more around that. And then I started reading book reviews but for, of you know Woodson's textbook, The Negro in Our History by people like Elaine Locke. Um, also Jesse Fawcett, she was a teacher in Washington DC and she also was the book editor for the Crisis Magazine. She also taught in Harlem for some time. Um, but she also wrote a review of the book and talked about how widely disseminated this was among black teachers um, and I started to delve more into it and I was started to become interested in this idea of what it meant to think about the intellectual history of black teachers. Um, and, you know, I thought Woodson was, I, I had I read The Miseducation of the Negro when I was in undergrad. It wasn't assigned in a class, but it was a, it was required reading for a student or an organization I had joined when I was in undergrad. We, we had, it was required that we, we had to read The Miseducation of the Negro. Mm -hmm. um, so I was familiar with Woodson from that um, but had no idea about his legacy as an educator, as a school teacher, um, 
and as someone who wrote textbooks and developed curriculum for black educators. Um, and so I delved more into it. And then I started to learn, actually, he wasn't the first black teacher to do this. There were there was Lila Amos Pendleton before him, who also wrote a textbook. Um, there was John Cromwell. There was Edward. There was, you know, Edward A. Johnson, right, a former slave who also wrote a textbook. And so I started to delve more into that and just realized that so many of the narratives that we have been given to talk about and to think about the history of black education really flattened the story of the things that black people had done and the experiences of black education to just the narrative of separate and unequal, right? Which is true, it's an important narrative. We have to take seriously the aggressive neglect and the violence of Jim Crow segregation, but we can never conflate black people's experiences to their to, to anti-black domination, right? Black life is always much more expansive um, and more dynamic than that. And I was interested in recuperating the history of these amazing things that black teachers were doing. And Woodson was just one example of the, the many, right? He was emblematic of this tradition. Um, and so my dissertation was on uh, that particular subject, looking at Woodson's ideas, you know, his theory around the miseducation of the Negro, but also his partnerships with black teachers across the country to challenge, um, you know, the distortion of black life and curriculum and to challenge the violent uh, oppression that black teachers and students were experiencing in schools. Um, so that, that was the, the dissertation. But then at the very end of the dissertation, I came across these, you know, some additional material that didn't make it into the dissertation, but I, I met, um, uh, there's a sister in, in Washington, D.C., or I'm sorry, just outside of D.C., who I connected with. She's an older Black woman who had these old videos um, from this organization called the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, which is the organization that Woodson founded. And so I went there and, you know, I looked at some of the videos and then I came across this, this story about this, form, this student talking about his former teacher in Louisiana secretly reading from Carter G. Woodson's textbook in the classroom in Webster Parish, Louisiana. He, he talked about, you know, uh, Tessie McGee reading to us from Woodson's book on the Negro, as he referred to it, um, and that if, and if someone would come into her classroom, he mentioned that she would stop reading from the book and continue reading from the required outline offered by the Louisiana uh, Department of Education. And then he mm. said, the door would close, her eyes went back to the book in her lap, right? That one scene of the, the kind of pedagogical move of this particular teacher and the student witnessing it and remembering how that impacted him, right? Because, because it exposed something about what was politically at stake in their education. And it also said something about how black teachers were navigating power in the context of Jim Crow schools. That was another layer to the, narr to the narrative that you know, is beyond just the textbooks themselves, right? It's beyond just the kind of, the, the new scripts of knowledge that black teachers are trying to create. It was both about rewriting the, you know, the system of knowledge, but also the methods of transmitting that information and that legacy to students that constituted what, I, what I've come to call fugitive pedagogy. Um, and, and, and I should say that the reason I use that language is because I wanted to tie these subversive practices of black teachers in the post-emancipation period to the things that we see black people doing during the period of slavery, right? When I read about, you know, black people on plantations going into the woods, you know, under the cover of night and climbing into holes in the ground to teach one another how to learn to read and write, I can't help but see a relationship between that or a young black boy named Richard Parker carrying a, a spelling book on his hat on his head concealed underneath a hat, right? I can't help but see a connection between that school, right? The spelling book under the hat and the textbook underneath the desk. Right? There's a relationship between those things that I wanted to write about and to say that this was a tradition, um, a core politics of Black education that we needed to recuperate and to talk about out in the open. Hmm. Be subversive. Wow. Yeah. That's, <laughs> uh, man, is it just inspiring, man? I'm so glad you took this on and really captured. Uh, I actually, and uh, when you were talking about the teacher closing the book, I actually remember, I remember being young and watching a film. It may have been one of Mildred Taylor's books where this teacher was under this pressure to stop teaching black kids well, right? And like she had to, I think she ended up getting, well, I'm pretty sure she ended up getting fired and harassed because 
you know, is it was similar to that story that no, they're like, no, teach this. And she like, uh, this ain't the path to literacy and liberation. Um, but you also bring me up with uh, this idea of Miller Granson, who had these midnight schools deep in Louisiana during enslavement period where she would have literally midnight schools, 12, 12 mm. students at a time uh, teaching them how to read, you know, and then once they graduated from her class, uh, then she would bring on another 12, right? And so we're talking about each one teach one, some of each one teach a thousand. Uh, and then this other <laughs> folks like Barry Meacham who had that riverboat school. Like, yeah, you know what? We can't teach uh, black people how to read on land, but this is independent territory. So I'm just gonna use a riverboat <laughs> in the uh, 1800s and teach on this riverboat, right? Like it just, like that's crazy, but it also shows the innovation and just the demand for education. Uh, for our children and how we looked at it as uh, a liberating effort. Right, and it's also important to emphasize that these are not just sporadic events, right? Mm -hmm. We start mm -hmm. to also we realize that these black people are doing these things almost universally across different states and different places, right? So this is a tradition of education that um, it, it's not just these kind of extraordinary people, right? You start to see it's like this is a teacher in rural Louisiana, this is Washington, this is Carter G. Woodson in Washington, DC, right? The story you just shared earlier about the teacher being fired sounds so similar to Anna Julia Cooper mm -hmm. being fired mm -hmm. as the principal mm -hmm. of you know the M Street School. It later becomes Dunbar, but you know, being fired as principal of the M Street School because of her um resistance to white school super, um, in superintendents and authorities in Washington, DC, even though the M Street School had been was outperforming you know, white students, both in the D.C. area and beyond in any kind of traditional, uh, you know, it, across any traditional metrics of accountability that we might think of, whether that be kind of, mm -hmm. you know, uh, proficiency and kind of like uh, language and math or their acceptance to both black and white colleges, uh, elite black and white colleges at the time. And this is she's fired in 1905 and also her bringing W.B. Du Bois to talk to the students and his him telling them about the critiques of, you know, industrial curriculum that they're trying to impose on the M Street School likely didn't make her a fan of the local kind of like white, um, you know, school authorities, right? Because that was an intentional jab at them and what they were trying to impose on the work that she was doing there. But th it's important to note that we can look to these, these special cases, but it's important that we see them as a part of a much larger and expansive tradition because black teachers were part of an, one of the things I'm trying to show in the book is that black teachers are part of a networked world, right? There were professional organizations that they created that modeled these standards of practice, right? Mm -hmm. They had no conceptions of what it meant to be a teacher that borrowed from the best of the traditional educational theories of the time, but that also merged that with what they were pulling from the black intellectual elite and shaping their own educational agenda. And that's really at the heart of what this legacy is, right? That teacher that I opened the book with, I didn't know this you know, when I started out, but after doing more digging, I found out, oh, well, the principal of this school is actually a black man who's a former candidate of the Louisiana Colored Teachers Association. Oh, and then when I look at the records of the Louisiana Colored Teachers Association, I see that they're recommending to teachers in a, a section under important news things about Carter G. Woodson's textbooks, right? Um, and also having Carter G. Woodson come and speak at their meetings for their uh, uh, state teacher associations, right? So that makes sense how this book from a teacher, Carter G. Woodson in DC, makes its way to a rural school in, um, in Northern Louisiana. It's because of these networks that black educators created to sustain themselves and to also advocate on their behalf and on behalf of their students. It's a different type of underground mm -hmm. railroad. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, um, what I find very interesting about this focus on the networks and the what I call black uh, educational capital, mm -hmm. because when I talk about 1954 and the 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 reversal of fortunes that came after 1954, the only thing I'm ever talking about is how much of education we owned for ourselves. Like the black educational capital was a thing that was lost. It wasn't just teachers' jobs. It wasn't just principal jobs. It was all the pedagogical information that they had in them that they had built up over years that was wiped away, that was wiped clean, right? And then we handed our kids over to people that didn't have that same level of 
not just jobs, pedagogical knowledge, information, educational capital. What did we own? So when I think about it that way, I think, well, OK, then that tells me that the goal today is to rebuild that capital. Like we have to rebuild that because, you know, 50, 60 years of not having it didn't work out for us. Like the whole, you know, promise of integration didn't deliver. So guess what? We got to go back and rebuild that. Your book, uh, and I would say also like the work of like Vanessa Siddle Walker and others, I think is restoring that capital. But how does it transmit from this, all this information that you found? It's almost, it, I feel like you're like, oh, I'm not going to, I'm going to mess up the movie reference. The dude in the Temple of Doom and, you know, Indiana Jones. I feel like you've gone and you've dusted some stuff off and you found like these great treasures. <laughs> and now I'm interested of how that gets shared with the world because isn't it a crime that you would be a teacher today in a classroom and you wouldn't know the stuff that you know? You wouldn't know the stuff that you found out? See, this is the, um, well, one of the ways you share is by putting in, hopefully folks will read the book. Um, but <laughs> Let's start with that. <laughs> I started with that because I did write it for those reasons because I realized that even the black teachers who are operating in this, in, in this tradition, are un, many of them are unaware of this legacy and what it means to situate themselves in relationship to a much to a history and a legacy and a tradition that is much longer than any of us have been alive, right? Um, and and when I've shared some of this information with educators in different places, the 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 looks on some people's faces is like, you know, how how is it that I never knew any of this information, right? Um, some folks who had parents and um, grandparents who might've been educators of you know, previous generations um, might say, oh yeah, I, I know a little bit about that because I recall um, one of the elders in my family who was a member of the Virginia uh, you know, Colored Teacher Association or something like that. But generally, uh, you know, te well, we should start by saying that teachers in general don't get any access to the history of education, let alone the history of black education because teacher training programs don't make space don't, don't, don't prioritize teaching um, what used to be called you know, foundations courses when it comes to training teachers. It's all about the transactional aspects of what's to happen in the classroom and what it means to mm. implement education policy. It's not about the kind of important humanistic questions that are, should always be at the center of education and what it means for teachers and students to realize that they're occupying you know, historically situated subjectivities as a teacher in a historically situated institution of, you know, when we think about school systems as, as having very long roots in our, the society that we live in, you know, teachers should be equipped in knowing the history of schools, but also knowing the history of the profession that they're in, and especially the history of black teachers, if you are a black teacher today, because, you know, there's so much that you can learn from the kinds of challenges that black educators were up against in the past. So many of it, so much of it has resonance with what black teachers say today, um, but also the kinds of strategies that they employed to navigate power. And, and just in general, you know, teachers are, are pe you know, we talk about students needing counter narratives. Teachers need counter narratives as well. Teachers also have to work mm. and be reflexive in terms of how am I intentional about crafting my own professional identity as an educator, <laughs> role this history play, and how I go about informing and shaping the educator that I want to be and that I'm striving to, uh, and the kind of education that I'm striving to model in my classroom with my students, right? All of that history should always be a social resource in that process because, you know, I, I'll, I'll stop there, but I, I, I do think that the point that you're making is really important, um, but it's also an indictment of teacher training programs and the failure to engage with history um, and for, for the sake of prioritizing things that are more transactional and procedural oriented about what, you know, what you're supposed to do to implement certain things in the classroom, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I, I think that that's a huge problem. Oh, absolutely. You uh. When you talk about that, you know, it, it just reinforces this idea that when you go to teacher colleges, um, typically, despite the fact of, you know, students look like us, the black and brown students in the in the situation, they're majority white, majority white women. And but it's not just who's going to eventually be in front of our children It's mm -hmm. who's training the trainers, who's teaching the mm -hmm. teachers. Right. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. if their whole framework a generation back, like in the freedom school tradition, it's always about 
what your intellectual genealogy, right? And so black teachers, if they're tapped into this network, as you said, and this legacy, they're, they have a particular intellectual genealogy that's, that's bent towards, oh, this is not just for, you know, for education space. This is for specifically liberation, liberatory efforts for yourself, but for the community as well. Like Chris always talks about your degree is a community degree, right? Like, and that's why, you know, sometimes folks can't understand why black folks celebrate like that at graduations and stuff like, cause it's a community degree. That's why it ain't just this, it's mm-hmm. all of ours. Like we all won this, we all had to resist and move. You saw, and you saw like how that. happy I got when I thought he went to Berkeley. Yeah, I wasn't happy for him. I was happy for us. <laughs> that was like, a, that's a communal degree. That degree is actually in service of our people. So I yeah. see a brother come out of, you know, Harvard and Princeton and whatnot. Oftentimes when I see people come out of those institutions, it's, it's actually not a communal degree and in service of our own knowledge. So when I see someone like you, Dr. Givens, who actually went and unearthed the things that need to be unearthed and bringing us our treasures back, I'm thinking to myself, this is exactly the way this is supposed to work. But I will say this, and this is a big but for me. Mm-hmm. I think one of the breakdowns that we have in this, in, the, in this work that we always talk about is we don't have enough power in determining for ourselves what a teacher should be what what uh what a k-12 education should be it's actually devised by somebody else and we're always playing catch up on trying to get to reform what they have already made rather than doing what we had been doing previously which is infiltrating and double crossing and keeping our kids in the safe harbor of our own pedagogical information and knowledge right so so uh um so i would be like wondering today like our black educators used to go into the community and tell the community what was needed. They used to go into like black communities, you know, black communities used to have a real strong relationship with their teachers. I think you wrote uh, something in your dissertation about triangulation between education and freedom. And, you know, uh, uh, um, the work wasn't just about what you just called the transactional work. It really was a communal project to make us free, not just to educate us on discrete pieces of information, but eventually to make us all free together. I just don't see it today where I see black educators working together with the black community to say, listen, regardless of what the state says and other people say, this is what first grade should look like for black children specifically, not for all children, for black children specifically, right? Uh, And then us come to a terms of, okay, well then what kind of teachers do we need to teach that? Good question. Who's going to teach them? Oh, good question. What are they going to be taught? Oh, good question. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That this is why, again, why I'm super, you know, inspired by the legacy of these educators is because what we see them doing, um, you know, I, I talk about the colored teacher associations and why they're so important. Um, it's because they are doing exactly what you're referring to. Is that we see in these space the the first black teacher association that we have records of was established in 1861 um, in Ohio, um, but then you start to see them grow uh, and proliferate after the emancipation period, particularly in the late 19th century, um, and you know they play a huge huge role in terms of sustaining and supporting the work that the subversive work that these educators were doing. But what we see them hap- what we see happening in these organizations is they're reading and they're studying about you know literature around best practices in terms of pedagogy and stuff like that but they're also reading the kind of political and intellectual scholarship that's coming out uh, from black scholars who you know whether it be Carter G Woodson or whether it be an Ida B Wells or whether it be you know uh, thinking of the, the leadership of Mary McLeod Bethune Mary McLeod Bethune is a huge leader in this world of teachers Um, And as the president of Woodson's organization um, for the last 15 years of his life, their partnership in terms of reaching teachers is something that I try to explore a bit in the book, uh, that I explore a bit in the book. But it was these spaces were important because we see teachers operating as more than just practitioners, right? We see them operating as scholars of the practice, which means that they are studying the, the transactional aspects of what it means to be a teacher, but they're also studying in deep conceptual ways how the work they're doing is related to larger political issues that black people are facing in and outside of the classroom and allowing that to shape their orientation to the work that they're doing. Right. So I think of things like 
there's one scene or one example that I, I you know, this is just one of many, but for instance, in a scene in 1934 with a group of teachers piled into a gymnasium and Du Bois is there giving a lecture on this book that he's researching that would the following year be Black Reconstruction, but he's talking to this gymnasium full of teachers and students um, and, and, and in New Orleans about both this history that he's uncovering about how we need to rethink and reteach uh, the period of reconstruction and all of this information that he's uncovering. And he's sharing this in the context of these teachers, right? And then the following year, right, we see it show up in one of these teacher magazines, uh, a pre-service teacher writing a review of Du Bois's book, Black Reconstruction, in their in their magazine, in their local magazine, right? And sharing mm -hmm. with other teachers, mm -hmm. encouraging them to think about this. And then it, it just so happens that there ends up being a Mardi Gras float, right, of students with reenactments from like, you know, black figures from the reconstruction period, right? So, so there we see, we can see and trace the kind of intellectual practices and the intellectual ideas circulating among teachers because they were creating these places for them to be studied, for, for them to engage in critical study that had to do with more than just what they learned in teacher training programs. And this is why Woodson, Woodson never taught teachers through you know, a, a teacher education program. He, he couldn't really do what he mm -hmm. wanted to do at Howard University. So he left Howard University after only being there for about a year and a half, maybe, because of his conflicts with the white president of Howard University, who, mm -hmm. who essentially pushed him out, right? Woodson, you know, he, he publicly critiqued the president's efforts to remove certain books from the library because they were perceived to have communist, communist leanings. Woodson refused to surveilled his colleagues and report back as to whether or not they attended chapel right oh, um, wow and you know and you know he uh the pre the president didn't like that woodson was offering uh continuing education courses to local teachers in washington dc without his knowledge mm -hmm. right so the and so and he said either public apologize publicly or you need to resign and woodson decides that he will resign Right. And he writes a very and some of the private letters and exchanges with some of his black colleagues who tried to convince him to stay are quite interesting and in, in, um, telling uh, about his thoughts on white leadership of black institutions at that time period. Um, but, yeah, so black teachers couldn't just rely on teacher training programs to get what they needed. Right. Woodson, mm -hmm. even as he had the highest degree that one could get. Right. And as someone who didn't start from folks who had high education, right? You know, it, it, you know, high levels of education. He was the child of former slaves and his first teachers were his formerly enslaved uncles in a one room schoolhouse, right? Mm. He didn't go to high school until he was 20 years old. He didn't start high school until he was 20 because he was working in the coal mines and teaching and reading to illiterate coal miners um, black news, from black newspapers and black books because they wanted to hear and interact with the literate with literate culture, even as they themselves could not decipher the written word, right? So for Woodson- You know what? I, I got to stop just here just for one second because everything you yeah, just yeah, said, yeah. you said so much there. <laughs> and this is what this is what I need my people here today to yeah. say that our kids can't learn because they're so poor or they're so traumatized or they're so this. What you just said about him and his life, he didn't go, <laughs> would you say he didn't go to high school until he was 20? Yeah, he started high school at the age of 20 at the Frederick Douglass High School, a, a school named for the, you know, the fugitive slave Frederick Douglass. Right. And where his cousin and, and where his cousin was the principal who was fired by the local white school board because of the political discourse in his self-published newspaper and his efforts to run an independent slate of wow. black political candidates. Right. So Woodson saw very early on the kind of surveillance of black teachers from you know his cousin, they had a shared name. His cousin name was Carter Barnett, who also was the principal of the Douglas High School in Huntington, West Virginia, and, and is fired um, because of his political activity, right? But who's mm -hmm. also one of the early founders of the West Virginia Colored Teachers Association. So Woodson, you know, the child of former slave, the student of former slave, you know, the a teacher of former slaves, right? If we think about this informal learning environment in the parlor of uh, Oliver Jones, who was a civil war, black civil war veteran who would pay Woodson to come and read to them, right? Um, like his entire, his entire life really reflects this narrative and this, this legacy of fugitive pedagogy in ways that become important um, to talk about what it means in the life of students, right? What it means in the mm -hmm. life of 
what it means in the life of an educational, the educational leader that he became. So we have no excuse. <laughs> the, the, the point, the thing I was trying to point out in, in the story is when you go back and you start reading the greats of our history and where they came from and how they struggled to get the education that they have and how they did it with excellence. Like they, they, you know, sometimes you're reading the stories and you're thinking this seems a little too easy for all that they were facing at the time. You know, he just yeah. went from this college to that college. And you're like, really? Like, you know, Let's in that time period, story. lift up that hood, <laughs> lift up the hood because we got too many people walking around today saying that kids with cell phones and too much to eat are actually like so broken down that they couldn't possibly learn some basic, you know, uh, pedagogical things. You know, it, it yeah. drives me yeah. crazy. I mean, this is, I mean, what you're, what you're saying, uh, Dr. Gibbons, I think is so important, just as, as Chris said. So uh, one, we used a lot of your research on Dr. Carter G. Woodson. It's really what inspired uh, Philly Seventh Ward, the Center for Black Educator Development and Citizen Education to, Citizen Ed to uh, do this Black Educator Hall of Fame series, right? Like, and it's like hundreds, right? We had to narrow it down for February, like 28. And we use a lot of your research to to pull from that. It was like it wasn't just that Carter G. Woodson uh, went to school for it uh, when he was twenty. Like telling that story of like, hey, he was a sharecropper and a miner, uh, mining the <laughs> land <laughs> before he could get there, right? And it was like, oh, I gotta, I'm, I'm here with my family. I gotta support. I gotta help. And then get to high school and finish in two years. And it makes me think of like as educators, what about the older black children who didn't finish school? Right. Like where, you know, everybody's talking like, oh, yeah, we're woke and this and that. Like, no, like, like stop talking so much and actually start schools. What about schools for overage kids who haven't graduated? Right. But and and name it like Carter G. Woodson. <laughs> this is this is this is exactly like what is the brilliance that's being lost because the traditional systems that uh, kids were in, or whatever system the kids were in was not working for them. And then, then they were like, did not, they're not connected to, uh, to education at that point. And then the other piece that makes me think of, and it doesn't, it could be HBCU starting, like which HBCU wants to step in and start schools for, since all the answers, you know, people have a lot of answers, but like, let's make them practical. Let's, let's apply them to the context of today. And we got a whole lot of overage kids that, that have been pushed out of school and don't see a connection between that and their future success. Let's let's start that. Put all those philosophies together and and do a Carter mm -hmm. G. Woodson type school, and make sure that we are as a collective mm -hmm. uh, supporting our our, our folks. So I, I just want to again just appreciate mm -hmm. uh, what you're saying. And this I think it's this combination as as Chris said, like how do we get it out there? It's your book, but there's also these HBCUs, right? Like and 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 making it. At the top of the priority, like every every year, people are like, well, we are reassessing our priorities. This is one priority that should never be reassessed. It stays there. How you do it, fine. They're like, yeah, they, you want to be agile in your pursuit of, of excellence. So, yeah, but the actual piece about education of our youth, that right. stays at the top. Our out-of-school time, we've talked about that a lot on, on our shows, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. owning that space, right? And so, as you said... Carter G. Wilson wasn't doing it through a traditional program. Howard, a black, you know, institution that was created, you know, supposedly for black folks, folks getting pushed out when they disagree with the politics of a black educator, right? And then also, as as Chris Father always uh, taught him, and we've kind of tried to really internalize, infiltrate and double cross in whatever institution you're in, and making sure that this information uh, gets in front of not just the children, because I think they can be part of the pushback. Right. You know, in the traditional schools, they can be part of the, the infiltration and double cross. They're sitting there as students like, no, Jack, this ain't this, ain't, mm -hmm. you know, this ain't history. This ain't true. Where's the, the kids books, aren't right? dumb. Yeah. They, aren't they dumb. know. Right. Like they, they know. know there's yeah. something askew, um, wrong. but giving them the language and the can helping them connect the dots. But then also the educators that are in, in these institutions, wherever it is. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to ask Dr. Givens about a very specific point because you keep mentioning the Negro um, Education Association. Uh, that was my next thing. Yes, had. so yes. so I want to. I want to. You know, Dr. Carr teases us with all these books that he has. So we want to hear what you're doing because Dr. Carr got like piles and piles of these uh, teacher association history. Well, books. here's here's what I specifically want to know though was like that was the main system of organizing the information and the keeping of the capital, the oh. educational capital. Um, when they were about to merge into the white unions, the presidents of the, the uh, and, and the leaders of black educators were telling them not to do it. 
they I, I've seen lots of historical record of them saying like Vanessa Siddle Walker covers this saying we will be second class citizens in somebody else's labor movement, basically. Yeah. So um, what did you find about that? What did you what do you see in terms of the benefits of them having had their own separate uh, uh, black folk, you know, uh, unions and organizations versus today where our black folks who are. I hate to do the air quotes. Educators are in white unions that really determine the agenda and their agenda isn't isn't what it used to be. Yeah. You know, I think that so I, I really see my work as an outgrowth of Vanessa Siddle Walker's work. I, I should say um, that same semester that I came across the footnoted reference to uh, Carter G. Woodson. I had also read in that same uh, semester their highest potential for the first time. So that's, that's mm. the first book. Mm -hmm. And. Yeah. It really, it, it, I, I, it just really struck me um, how much the story of the Coswell County Training School that Vanessa writes about in that book, um, how much it resonated with my own experience at the small black parochial school I attended in Compton, California, which is where I'm from. I'm originally from Compton, and and I was just so struck by the similarities, right? Because when I got to college and started to learn about, you know, black student underachievement, started to learn about, you know, like so many of my, of my peers never had black teachers. I was like, oh shit, that's crazy. I had black teachers my entire life. I only had black teachers. Um, <laughs> and I only, ha I didn't think about my experience in school as negative. It, it was always, for the most part, a positive experience. Um, you know, when I, when I thought about the educational experience that I had, and even in high school, uh, the high school that I went to was a public high school and was over 75% black and the majority of the teachers and administrators were also black. Um, and I mean, you mentioned me going to, to, you know, to Berkeley. I wasn't the only one. There were 22 of us from my high school in Watts that was 75% black and 20, you know, close to 25% Latinx. I was 22 of us from my high school that got into Berkeley my year. So mm. when I, when I mm. went with, with friends from the school that the high school that I went to and we had black teachers. Um, and I was saying that to, to, I just wanted, just wanted to kind of uh, to, to kind of clarify that point. But when it comes to the, so when I was reading Vanessa Siddle Walker's book, so much about what she was writing about felt like it resonated with the experience that I had. And that's what initially made me decide to kind of press more and to dig more, right, into that history. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I started to look at the records of black teacher associations, it was for pragmatic reasons for me, because I wanted to trace how can I demonstrate, improve the kind of the, the, the breadth and depth of Woodson's influence in the circulation of his ideas? And it became convenient to go, oh, well, let me go to the publications of Colored Teacher Associations, which was, you know, publications that they publish on a monthly or quarterly basis and see if he comes up. Absolutely, he did. You find excerpts of speeches of Woodson speaking to teachers at their teacher meetings. You find um, lists of Black teachers gathering together to organize around what it, how to interpret and incorporate black life and culture at the, you know, the, the elementary school level, at the middle school level, at the high school level, right? And they're being organized within these divisions in the teacher associations to set up committees to figure out how to do this work, right? Um, and so for me, what I'm finding is that the records of these teacher associations that are really scattered and all over the place. When Vanessa tells a story about how she got access to the records for Georgia, which is what her book is based on, it's because the, uh, the former executive director, recognizing what was happening as these organizations were merging, he decided to kind of preserve all of these materials because he mm. knew that they were gonna be important because of the way in which they were being, these organizations were so quickly being integrated out of existence and the way in which you know, the principals and the teachers were being fired and demoted and undermined in the process of how desegregation was being rolled out. Right. Um, and so what I'm doing now is I'm trying to not trying to. I am. I got a, I got a grant from the Mellon Foundation to digitize and preserve the publications of colored teacher associations across the various different states and also the national organization. And what we're doing, I'm saying we because it's myself and my colleague, Professor Imani Perry, we're um, creating an online portal called the Black Teacher Archive, where we're going to house these digitized materials so that they can be available for research but also so that they can be available for teachers to engage with um, and to think about what it means to organize around these kinds of ideas, but also um, what we can learn from 
the records of these organizations. And, it, and it's also important mm. because these documents demonstrate the kind of the, the hidden role that black teachers played in the long black freedom struggle. We don't have a, a Malcolm X, we don't, um, well, actually not Malcolm X, we don't have a Martin Luther King or Angela Davis or John Lewis had it not been for the teachers that they talk about that they had, right? They didn't just fall out of the sky out of nowhere. These were people that were enacting and putting into practice in the black freedom struggle ideas that were implanted in them based on the social emotional context that black teachers created and intentionally so, you know, in these in these schools that they were shepherding and that they were um, where they were teaching them. And you you find that teachers mm. being explicit about this, right? In Vanessa Soto Walker's book, there's a part where Lucy Laney is at an NAACP meeting in like 1919, and she says, um, you know, she says we may not be able to vote now, but we're going to teach civics, we're going to teach these things to students to help them imagine a world that doesn't exist and to fight mm -hmm. for, it, right? Um, so they're very intentional about these things that they're doing and they have the, the professional space and the space to come together and to gather collectively and in private also is important to say to do that work. I, I just want to like call out because you hit my button on one. You hit my button on so many things. But Lucy, Lucy Craft Laney is always lost to history. Uh, black woman got the first charter in the state of Georgia, got a charter from the state. Does that sound familiar? Got a charter from the state of Georgia to start the first black kindergarten, uh, which became a first grade and a second grade. When she started, she had a handful of students show up the first day and word got around and boom, before you knew it, it went from, from three to 30 to 60 to 100 to 300. She had to travel across the country to get money, got money from... Um, from various philanthropies uh, to get started on her very important work. Out of her schools came people like uh, Mary McLeod Bethune. Uh, I just like to always, you know, you can always trace these things back. She also sits in a place that I want to ask you about because you have a really unique concept about answering something me and Sharif argue about sometimes. I don't know if we argue about it, but <laughs> you're going to decide it here. Uh, I like to give us, I'll win, but it's yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so, 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 yeah. So you can decide this for us, Dr. Givens. Um, you, you wrote in your dissertation um, something I thought was really interesting around, let me see how you put it. Um, this is about the Du Bois Washington kind of um, binary, the way that we look at black education history, right? And you write, Du Bois Washington, the Du Bois Washington binary stems from the opposing ideological camps of white philanthropy and lacks attention towards the agency of black educational thinkers who ide ideologies extend beyond uh, said parameters. Man, you're so good. Um, in other words, black educational thinkers are not as easily placed within the spectrum of the Du Bois Washington camps, which mimics the divide between missionary and industrial capitalist ph philanthropy. I could keep going, but what you are basically saying here is that binary locks us into an intellectual headlock that's too small for actually the whole heritage. So you introduce this concept of black educational heritage. The reason I think it's interesting is because Laney, who I just mentioned, Laney was cool with both. She Absolutely. was cool with both. And she, you know, she was trying to do her own thing, though. She wasn't trying to be Mr. Washington and she wasn't trying to be Du Bois. How do you call this? Because listen, I'm clearly a, a a Washington dude, and Sharif for some reason is clearly a Du Bois dude. Well, well let but, me, I want to give both a little additional context. You know, so. How how I originally argued it, but then you know Chris is like relentless, so you with him you got to take a side. I didn't want it when take he first side. came with this debate. I was like, well, yeah. for how we used to teach our students at Shoemaker. Um, uh, Abigail Henry, the, our, our, our Africana studies teacher, she would say, you can't, she said it, you know, similarly, but, you know, to, to these ninth graders. And what she would say is, you can't really understand uh, black history by looking at this one person. She's like, no matter how much they put, here's the stamp, this is your person, right? Like it, it flattens them. She said, to understand the black educational experience, you have to look at people as a collective, almost like they come, they form one person, mm -hmm. When they come together and she would have like this trifecta she would say to really understand that time you have to look at wb du bois booker t washington and marcus garvey she said that as a collective then you can study it she's like if you only study pieces of booker you're not going to understand the that's entire right. context and so that's how i started off but then at the end of the day i had to like think i was just like all right i gotta i'm going with <laughs> wow. and i understood you know uh where chris is coming from but i would rock with uh 
uh, Bugart. What, what is his middle oh, name? Oh, wait a second. Now, Bogart. yeah, Bugart. Bogart. You know, <laughs> you know, eating his cucumber sandwiches up north with with white folks while Booker was actually building actual schools where people actually get educated. But, but he Dr. trained Davis, teachers. You know, so, he did ahead, train. Like, I'm not. I'm not gonna undercut the brother. But you know what? Out of the two of them, out of the two of them, I'll say this. Washington left behind physical buildings and places where st education still goes on. By the end of W.B. Du Bois's life in Africa, he was very dis disenchanted with everything that he had done with it, America. Like, I think, you know, he had a, he had eventually come to some point saying who he thought were allies, actually, in the struggle his whole life were not actually allies. Right. He had changed his mind. Yeah. But, he Dr. Evans, not to put you on the spot, idea, right? I, I do want to say this, this educational heritage vision you have of it. I want to know more about that. Like, yeah. how, tell me about I, that. I must say that I was nervous when you said I'm going to read something for your dissertation because I have not <laughs> my dissertation since I turned it in. And I wasn't even sure. I, I didn't remember that I talked about that point in there. Um, see, see how we bring stuff back to people that they did. <laughs> Listen, that's one of Chris's hobbies is reading dissertations. Like you know, he'll, he'll grab that faster than a book. Like he he gets it's my it. favorite thing to do. If oh, you I, did I, the research, yeah. I love reading dissertations. I love yeah. it. I wanted to embargo it, uh, but I didn't feel like I I didn't want to take the chance of like doing it wrong and delaying like filing because <laughs> I needed to move on. But I appreciate you bringing that point to the fore because you know one of the things. One of the things I'm trying to say there is that I do think that this binary that we continue to use to frame the history of black education is limiting. And I want to say how I came to that point. When I started giving talks about um, Woodson, you know, at conference and things like that, people would continuously ask, well, would you say that Woodson is more of a Washingtonian or a Du Boisian kind of educational thinker? And I was never able to really offer a, a good to give a good response to that because it just doesn't make sense to think about black teachers and the ways in which how they're negotiating power, how they're negotiating a very complicated, you know, um, economic landscape when we're thinking about who and how who they're having to rely on to to acquire funding in order to build schools. Right. It's just it's very limiting. But also we would find that. When we when we look at Du Bois and when we look at Washington, neither one of them are completely you know, uh, you know, one or the other, right? It's always a combination of the two, but I will say that the, the manipulative practices of white philanthropists did really undermine any of the efforts, many of the efforts that Booker T. Washington, of Booker T. Washington as he tried to kind of play both sides in a certain kind of way, right? But one of the things that I was interested in pointing at there is that when we, when we named this the Du Bois-Washington debate, we fail to account for how white philanthropy and white um, capital is actually behind the scene facilitating this kind of dysfunction that we actually see playing out in black education, right? Mm -hmm. It's you you have this case where they're using, you know, Booker T. Washington as this kind of figurehead in a certain in, in a particular way, and then you using this to kind of fund only certain kinds of black education and to defund others in very strategic ways, right? To starve particular schools, whether it be, you know, Anna Julia Cooper's, you know, efforts, um, or I think of John Davison in Georgia, who was fired because he, you know, was secretly teaching Latin, right? <laughs> and because white philanthropists felt like he wasn't um, uh, fully committed to the industrial education model that they demanded that he followed, right? So you start to see this kind of policing and violent surveilling of black teachers, um, you know, that is really behind what we're calling the Du Bois Washington debate, which is a misnaming. We need to, we have to name the kind of white philanthropists and Northern corporate elites that are in the background that have near complete control in setting the agenda for black education at a structural level um, that, that we've been calling the Du Bois Washington debate. That's a misnaming. And it and it and it det it det detracts right from what's actually taking place, and meaning that we have to think about the relationship between capital um, and white educate. I mean, black educational strivings and how white capitalist efforts were undermining it at every turn because of an investment in maintaining black people maintaining black people's status as an exploitable group of laborers, um, and that's something that we can't lose sight of, even as we can acknowledge the kind of aspirations and striving that Booker T. Washington had 
um, as he was trying to build and you doing very practical things. And there are people that have written about, you know, uh, Washington and, and some of the things that he did behind the scene uh, to support black efforts and to support black businesses and to challenge white supremacy and lynching and things like that. We know that that's true, um, but we're, we're, we're distracting ourselves when we focus on these individual people and, and don't look at the structures that are facilitating this dysfunction. Mm. Love it. I think you, are you muted? I was saying, I think you, um, you, you threaded a middle ground there. You threaded the needle <laughs> on it, you know, a middle ground. Well, and so um, the reason I have to say this is because, so, you know, there are letters, you know, uh, Carter G. Woodson, you know, he was a fan of Washington. He could, be, he could be a fan of Washington and also respect Du Bois, right? There are letters within the span of two years of him writing, of him going to see Booker T. Washington speak while he's a college student, right? And then him writing a letter to Du Bois as he's trying to go to graduate school and to write a, to write a thesis, right? So even someone like Woodson can look to both of them and see the merits of what it is that they represent. Same thing with mm -hmm. Mary Cloud Bethune, right? Or Nanny Helen Burroughs who people mm. often refer to as the black, the female version of Booker T. Washington, right? But we also know that she, you know, even as she understood that these working class black girls that were attending her school would likely go on to be in the roles of, you know, perhaps domestic servants or, um, you know, take on kind of uh, different kinds of trades, she still found it important to teach them high, you know, languages, right? Um, high forms of math, high levels of math and also incorporated Negro history as a requirement in her school as well, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. fully industrial model, it was oftentimes a hybrid of the best of what these educators understood to be, um, you know, what it was that, that the students they were serving needed. Um, so, and even when we think about Booker T. Washington, you know, he sent his daughter to Fisk, which was the complete opposite of, you know, mm -hmm. the, of education so it's not <laughs> i love you that you landed it right there that's a perfect you know just turn Stop it, it change the topic right now <laughs> stop it el mecky right. this, this is this is why i look at, at washington as really like one of the the figures within our heritage that we have to pay homage to which is mm -hmm. i think he deeply believed that you don't have any power unless you own what you own yeah. Like you own it. You have to own the school. You don't like sin. It, integration is not going to be your salvation. The thing that is going to make people respect you is that you own yourself. You own your buildings. You own your land. You own your pedagogical practices. And, you know, I think for him, there was a group of people who were saying, if we could just educate the most talented blacks, yeah. uh, then they'll save the rest of us. And he was thinking, no, you need to get the masses of blacks something that gives them a modicum of income and of power and of ownership. And that is still at play today. We have people today in, in 2021 who think that the best we could possibly do is integrate the suburbs or integrate schools and integrate other people's thing with never owning our own stuff, not owning our own pedagogy, our own teachers, our own practices, our own buildings, you know? Uh, and I don't get it. Yeah. I literally do not get it. Well, what you just said sounds like the very same thing Du Bois said in Souls of Black Folks, though. Because he, he never said that we should not engage and do industrial education. He just said it can't be an essentialist approach. We can, white philanthropists were interested in only offering that, right? Du Bois was absolutely on board in saying that industrial education is important. And we have to think broadly about this, but we also can't completely push aside the importance of leadership, of cultivating leaders for the race, right? And to people and to and also co cultivate political advocacy as well. Um, so he's pushing back more so on the effort of white philanthropists who are trying to say this is it's this way and this way only, right? Yeah. Teach people to be workers and nothing else. Yeah. Right. That's the only thing that well, they and I don't think that like like Washington was never saying that we should teach people to do just do this either too because he was trying to build uh, educational leaders within his institutions black leaders he was just also saying we should have something for the masses but i think what the thing that we also often forget is that w.e.b du bois had his white philanthropists on his side too pushing one thing which was we will be free if we can vote now now think about this in the 2021 context that it will be free if we can vote well right? yeah so 
Well, it's, we could vote right now. We still yeah. don't own nothing, right? It's, it's white. It's, it's white philanthropy on both sides. Is what I'm saying. That yeah. we call it Du Bois in Washington. But what I'm saying is that we need to expand the aperture and not think about these two singular thinkers and leaders. We need to think about the competing, the ideological struggle between competing white um, philanthropy philanthropic camps that are facilitating this dysfunction. Is what I'm saying. Um, and that, so that's on the industrial practical education side. And it's the same thing on the classical liberal arts education side when we think about white missionary philanthropy. Um, yeah. And so it, it's, it's absolute, that's, it's, it's white people and it's white paternalism, right? That is facilitating the dysfunction that, that that's happening there. Um, and that, that's mostly what I'm trying to say. And still today, I would say, um, I like your your I like where you land on that by looking at the entire educational black heritage and putting it all together so that there's something for everybody. I mean, today we have this argument where people say college isn't for everybody. And honestly, they're usually meaning somebody else's kids. They're not usually meaning their own kids when they say that, you know, college ain't for everybody. And they're not usually meaning their own kids. But then again, we also do forget about things like career and technical education and things that don't require that you go to a four year college. We started, you know, shifting. And I'm thinking like more in line with you. There needs to be some of that for everybody. Like wherever you are in life, if you're going to do four years, do four years. You're going to do two years, do two years. Right. You know, if you want to get certifications and micro degrees, do that, you know. Right. And someone like Woodson would say that we need to think about education beyond pathways to professional professions and occupations. Um, that we can't yeah, leave with, yeah. um, because there are always ways in which, the, you know, though there are always impediments to that, which is why when we ha have kind of full focuses on STEM education or some other kind of education because of the labor demands in the job market, right? That's constantly changing in all sorts of ways. Someone like Woodson would say, you have to lead with the kind of the, the higher substance of what education is supposed to be about. And when we're talking mm -hmm. about form of education, that's something that's important for people, irrespective of what the kind of education that Woodson and the best of educators in the Black tradition are talking about. It's not just about the kind of practical orientation to what career path is it leading to. Obviously, we have to think about that as well. But when it comes mm -hmm. to the substance of any kind of liberatory educational model, it, it, you, you can't necessarily, you can't lead with that. You can't lead with the demands of the labor market and capital to dictate what the values and the ethics guiding our educational principles should be. Um, you have to account for it and think about it because we have to live, we have to make a living, we have to build a world, sustain ourselves. But right, that's not necessarily what feeds your soul and that's not necessarily what mm. your capacity as a people to understand what it means to have a high level of self-worth and to lead dignified lives and to be in right relationship with one another and the world, right? That, that's what I think that's what Woodson would say um, mm. about Things. And I think that that's something we often lose sight of today. I, I, I mean, that's quickly. a tough one. <laughs> it's it tough. Is. <laughs> you know? And I, I know yeah. we're almost like out of time. Hopefully we you can uh, indulge us a little bit longer. Um, but, you know, one thing just before we uh, I would love just to go back to the National Teacher Association, the black ones, because you you in the like the middle of the book, uh, you, you quoted a, a, a Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Uh, and I thought it was really important where he was talking to a black teacher who was just like, yeah, I hear you, but you know, I'm paraphrasing. You didn't write it like this, but you know, I, I, I want to go to the, to the, uh, white conferences. I don't want to go to those black educator conference. I want to go to the white jaws. They, they got this and that is fancy schmancy and all that. And Carter G. Woodson, you quoted saying like, yeah, cool, go. But if you're not tapping into these black institutions, you need to resign. <laughs> you know, if you're not tapping into what black children actually need, if you don't look at that as your paradigm and worldview, that your priority are the black children you're supposed to lead and serve, resign. Turn resign from the teaching core. <laughs> and I was like, yo. He said, You sound like an unfit person to be teaching black kids, is essentially what he said. If if you feel like going to the National Education Association is um more important than going to Meharry College, where the Black, the National Association of Teachers and Colored Schools are meeting, then you completely are misunderstanding the political landscape that you're operating in, and you obviously don't have the political clarity that you need to to to, to reach and to meet the needs of Black children. Um, and he he says that a number of times, right? Mm -hmm. Same way that he says that John Dewey is not good enough 
for thinking about the needs of black children. Thank he, you. He, Thank he you. Says, there's the one quote when he says, I met one educator who could talk about all the educational theory from Socrates down to the day of Dewey, but was ineffective in the lives of black children, right? Mm -hmm. And so essentially he's saying white theories of education fail to account for the structural realities of black life. And absent that, you are not accounting for the, the, the deeper kind of, you know, what's at stake and what the costs are um, for and what's at what's at stake in black you know for black education right so you have yep. to engage with the you know essentially he's saying the scholarship in in black thought right black um black study essentially is what he's saying these teachers are in before black studies was in the university in the late 1960s moving forward black teachers are the people that are transmitting the tradition of black studies that will become implanted in the american university in the late 1960s and there's no other way to, to kind of say that. Even when we look at the, the, the books that black students at places like Berkeley and San Francisco State and Harvard were reclaiming, the, the, those writers, the people who were writing those books, many of them were black teachers themselves or had taught in black schools at some point. And I'm not talking about just universities, I'm talking mm -hmm. about K through 12 schools, people yeah. like mm -hmm. Anna mm -hmm. Cooper who wrote, um, you know, a voice, you know, her, her book, A Voice from the South by a Black Woman from the South, as she was a teacher and at, at the M Street School, right? They were reclaiming and, and creating courses called The Miseducation of the Negro, right? By Carter G. Woodson. Ida B. Wells was a school teacher, right? And worked in one of the teacher associations um, and was fired as a teacher because of her exposing <laughs> a scandal between uh, white superintendents and a number of um, educators in in the the district, which is why she's fired um, in Memphis, and so, but also the, the the writers, Zora Neale Hurston, was she was educated by black teachers, right? And if we read her autobiography, she talks about Dwight, you know, um, Dwight uh, Dwight Holmes when she goes to high school in Baltimore and his expo exposing her to literature and the way that he taught it and how that impacted her, right? Um, all of these books and things that we end up reclaiming in Black Studies are the product of, of a set of traditions of Black Studies that were that were passed on through and through other means, but in very systematic ways through Black teachers and their organization and their organizing efforts. Mm. So, <laughs> and I know we got to run, but again, we you know I love having you here because you can answer lots of questions for us. You can yeah. fix some things for us. Do you think that Black educators should have uh, their own associations again? I I feel like that's a question for black educate. I, I always try to be mindful of the fact that I am not dealing with the day-to-day -day operations of what it means to teach in public in public schools and in classrooms. Um, and so I usually try to offer what I have in the book and what I know as a historical scholar as a mm -hmm. resource for teachers to build and do what they as they see fit. However, when I look at what these teachers were doing and the kind of, you know, the effects of you know what it was of their organizing effort in these organizations, I absolutely see a need, right, for some of the things that these organizations offered in the current moment, um, mm -hmm. and I, I think that that's something to consider. I can't tell people what they should do, but if I was a teacher, I would love to be a part. If I was a teacher, I would love to be a part of these kind of organizations that people like Mary McLeod Bethune, Ida B. Wells, Carter G. Woodson, W. E. B. Du Bois, right, and all these folks, and James Weldon Johnson, right. You know who gave us the Black National Anthem, mm -hmm. right? He was a president. He was in the teacher organization in Florida, who gave us the Black National Anthem because he wrote it for his students to sing, right? Um, I would want to be a part of something like that. That's what I would mm. say. So the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> After all that, the answer, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, I think the answer is. I think. I mean, there's. It's hard for me to read that history and not think, damn, we need that. Mm -hmm. Like what they had, they had sophisticated ways of understanding information across states. You mentioned that earlier today. Like Absolutely. we don't, we, we don't pay attention to, they were organized and they had information exchanges across Southern states that were sharing information. Boy, it would be great to do that again. They were taking the standards, the white standards and taking it to their own camps and figuring out how to translate that for the students that they were working with. Right. They were our translators and they were working with communities to understand what we were up against because they were educating more than children. They were educating the community on like what the problems were. Man, that all sounds like good stuff. We should have that again. 
and you, you use the language of translators, that's the exact language that Mary McLeod Bethune used. In 1935, she gives a speech at this or the associate at Carter G. Woodson's organization. This is the year before he acts her, you know, before she steps up to become the president. Um, even though she doesn't have a PhD, right? She didn't have a PhD mm -hmm. in like that. This is an academic organization, but recognizing her as an important political force, Woodson, you know, wanted her to be the, the president of the organization. But she, you know, speaking to the, 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 the group of people at this meeting, she says, we're in need of translators who can take this knowledge being published in the Journal of Negro History and by scholars like Carter G. Woodson and to translate it to students in the classrooms, right? So then the following year, mm -hmm. you see all of these um, workshops and meetings at the association meeting the following year when she's president um, in terms of talking about what it means to interpret the history and the work that's being done by people like Du Bois and Woodson um, for it to be translated for the needs of students. And then the year later, mm -hmm create the Negro History Bulletin, which is a magazine for teachers and students um, written at a fifth grade reading level so that it could be accessible um, and, and can be used to build curriculum around in schools across the country, right? So that idea of translating was very important for these organizations where you see not just K through 12 teachers, but also professors, oh, actually I shouldn't say professors because Woodson was never a professor at a university because he was run out of them, right? But you know, like the boys and Woodson in these organizations meeting with educators at the K through 12 level and you know exchanging ideas, right? That scene of the of Du Bois in the in the gymnasium talking to teachers, and then the teacher writing a review of his book in their teacher magazine. This is how you see educate black education stretching across the higher ed and the K through 12 level and recognizing there's a need for this information to kind of um, shape a more kind of holistic vision of what education is supposed to be, uh, you know, for black folks. I love it. Well, yeah. I appreciate yeah. you, brother, for giving us an hour of your time today. Sharif, you have any final words? Yeah, I just want to thank you again, Dr. Gibbons, for coming on. I know, you know, we'll be in touch. I know our Freedom School Literacy Academy uh, teacher apprentices will need to hear from you um, and, and learn from you, uh, as well as, you know, uh, I know Shana Terrell will be reaching out for the building of what she's calling also rebuilding the Black Educator Pipeline uh, show. Mm -hmm. So that's one, because uh, what, you, what you're sharing, this is also, you, you've said to, at some point, like, I'm not a teacher, then what the heck have you been doing the past uh, <laughs> hour and, you know, yeah, know. like, no, this is, this is teaching, this is exactly, yeah what teaching is so uh, I agree. but I, I say that because I, I and I say that because I try to be intentional I don't like I don't like when researchers and scholars um you know a, a, lack of, a lack of appreciation for the work that teaches humility no I appreciate I appreciated the humility and I just wanted to to uh you know just acknowledge like this was this is a a well developed lecture you know a, a teaching hour um, and then I would just I it would just double down on what you said as far as like, you know, uh, how teachers are trained and they're learning about, you know, these white education theorists, these white behavior theorists, these white uh, child psychologists, human growth development theorists, all of this. And then they're being sent into schools full of black and brown children. Right. And so like their whole their whole world view is jacked up. And so when most of them say I'm not prepared to teach black and brown kids. Uh, but teacher colleges aren't listening to them. They're like, oh, just go anyway. And they're like, yo, I'm not prepared. A year, you know, mm -hmm. before they get there, student teaching, the day, the first day, a year later, they're saying we're not, we were not prepared. Thousands of dollars, four plus years later. But also those, those uh, teacher college professors, they don't know, they choose to ignore, they choose to erase the Dr. Carter G. Woodson's or the Joanza Kunjufu's or the Vanessa so or like whoever it is that's doing that research. And this is what needs to be front and center in teacher prep programs. Uh, and then, you know, this whole idea, I really want to just uh, appreciate and challenge HBCUs. You know, the gaps, the holes, the, the, the chaos, like this is what HBCUs, this is, they were stepping into chaos, right? Like in the midst of chaos, advance, advance, advance. And I know you're underfunded. I know that. And step up and step in, you know, particularly and start with the kids that nobody, uh, everybody's abandoned. Those overage, those kids who've been pushed out, those kids who who are not connected. Right. And we all know about the African tradition of uh, what the youth will burn down if they don't feel the warmth. Right. And um, and then lastly, just thanks for today. 
but also thank you for, uh, you know, for your work, for archiving, uh, you know, our, our history and making it accessible. I'm just deeply appreciative and grateful um, for your work, brother. Um, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And again, thanks for having me on to, to share the work. And I, I'm looking forward to more conversations like this. This is very helpful for me, too. Well, you know, we have so many other things for you to settle for us. So we're going to have to have you, we got to have you come back, you know, we got to have you come back on a regular basis and, and fix some of these things for us. Here's my final word on it. Um, information is king and key and information about self, like know thyself is like one of the oldest kind of uh, proverbs mm -hmm. in the world. Like if you don't know yourself and where you've been and what you've done, you'll fall for any story about where you've been and what you've done. So when it comes to education, we can't win the education wars for our children if we're ignorant, completely ignorant to, to what we've actually contributed to the field in the past. So when I see people like you, like Raiders of the Lost Arts, the people who actually go and find like what we used to do and brush it off and show people this is our heritage this is who we are and this is what we've known and this is what we've forgotten this is what the the the, the ice age that came after integration which was disintegration for black educational theory history heritage and all that um is is what's dogging us right now we are putting our hand our kids into the hands of people who don't even know what they don't know and how can that be uh, a good situation for our kids, for, for, for our, for our uh, young people? So what I would hope that would happen is researchers who have the information like you, authors, teachers, educators, university presidents, leaders of civil rights groups, uh, black folks have a lot of infrastructure, social, political, and economic infrastructure that should be transmitting the information that you have found. We should, it should be at the, the forefront of, of what we think of when we think about winning a better education for our kids. Um, for people listening and watching, I want you to go and find Dr. Givens' work. First of all, you can find on Amazon, you can find his book, Fugitive Pedagogy, uh, The Art of Black Teaching. Um, you can also find him um, um, online on Twitter. Uh, what's your Twitter handle? It's, it's right there on your, your thing here, Dr. Givens. I, I just joined like a week ago. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what is up with these cats in academia getting like brand new Twitter handles. Like, <laughs> took it a while. In, I've been in the archives. <laughs> yeah. Well, welcome, brother, to, to Twitter. Um, uh, let's see what happens now. Uh, for yeah. those watching, this has been an hour with Dr. Uh, Jarvis Givens. He's an assistant professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and then Suzanne Young Murray, assistant professor at the Radcliffe Institute. Uh, as I just said, his book is um, Fugitive Ped Pedagogy, The Art of Black Teaching. Please buy it. Uh, we support black authors. Uh, I got my copy. I did a, a Kindle copy, of course, because I support uh, sustainable reading. Don't need to kill no trees. Um, but, you know, do what you got to do. Uh, Dr. Givens, one last parting shot, brother, which is just, you know, I love, love, love information and archives. Uh, so this thing that you're doing with uh, archiving this important history for us, I think is important. That's not going to have a firewall, is it? No, no, no. It's going to be it's going to be accessible to the public. That's one of the things. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Automatic for the people. All right. Good. Good. Because uh, I'm sick of these firewalls, uh, which are Berkeley folks. Um, anyways, <laughs> appreciate those of you who have watched this for an hour. This has been another Freedom Friday and you are still not free, but hopefully you're freer after this hour than you were than when we started. Uh, enjoy your weekend. Look out for each other. Stay safe. Do your best to like uh, keep your mind and your body uh, um, uh, well right now because it is.